The next thing to talk about is uniform circular motion. Uh, so uniform circular motion is a fairly common state of motion in physics problems. Uh, and we sort of saw this alluded to with the merry-go-round problem a little earlier. Uh, and the statement is basically that if a object is traveling at a speed v on a circular path of radius r, there must be an acceleration towards the center of the circle with magnitude v squared over r. Not telling you that there's a force or anything like that. I just say that to stay on that trajectory, you need an acceleration pointing towards the center. Uh, you can figure uh, this out by kind of considering this uh, in terms of geometry. This is a little satellite image of a car uh, rotary, um, and here's a little truck uh, going around it now and a little bit later. And these are some velocity vectors uh, that I've sketched in. Now, uh, if we look at the now and the later, and we take later uh, minus now, that acceleration vector points towards the center of the circle, and we need to figure out how big it is. And you, that v squared of r is reasonable. It's got, it should be related to how big the circle is. Uh, if I'm going around a smaller circle, I need to change my velocity vector more. Uh, if so I need something that gets bigger as the radius gets smaller. And uh, if velocity vector is bigger, it needs more of a change. So the v squared over r is a reasonable kind of scaling. Uh, we can sort of work it out by thinking about a coordinate system where there is a uh, position uh, vector anchored at the center. The origin here is at the center. Our position vectors go to the truck now and truck later. There's a little bit of an angle in between them here, and then a change in the uh, uh, displacement vector, or, or the displacement vector is uh, the uh, vector straight down there. Okay, and so if we actually consider the position here, and we think about the uh, velocity vectors that we looked at earlier and figure out what the acceleration is, uh, we come to the realization that these two triangles are similar in their relationships. Namely, that the uh, scale, uh, to stay on a circle, uh, the velocity vector uh, relative to its magnitude must ha be proportional to the displacement vector Rel oh, sorry, the change in velocity relative to the mag the speed must be uh, proportional or must be equal to the um, change in displacement or the displacement vector relative to the size of, of the circle. And so uh, since we sort of have a side angle side uh, side angle side uh, scaling relationship, they can be they are similar. And so that allows us to sort of equate uh, these two expressions and find that delta v is the speed uh, over the radius times the displacement. And then if I carry out divide by delta t and take the limit as this goes to zero, this delta r over delta t becomes the v squared over r, and that's my centripetal acceleration. That uh, comes from Latin. It just means center seeking. So it's the acceleration pointing towards the center. I'll note mechanically, we often deal with uh, the period and we'll say that the period of the rotation, I just want to note the vocabulary here, uh, is that circular motion uh, undergoes a period in one revolution around the circle. And so basically the time it takes to do that is the distance over the speed uh, the distance it has to travel is 2 pi r, uh, the speed is v, and so the period is 2 pi r over v. Now, I'm very careful in first year physics, this is the centripetal acceleration. I don't want to say the words centrifugal force. Centrifugal force only shows up in non-inertial reference frames. More on that in a few slides. Uh, but it is what we call fictitious, which is largely from your choice of reference frame. And it's important, uh, and we'll show up with it, but we need to get into the physics of accelerating reference frames, to which I defer to my esteemed colleagues in, who are going to be teaching Physics 244. Uh, just wait for it. It's fantastic. Uh, but... Um, We'll uh, not do that right here. What we will do is non-uniform circular motion. So what happens, uh, v squared over r is the acceleration if the v isn't changing. 
If the object is speeding up or slowing down, then there's an acceleration in the tangent direction. We saw that with the a dot v calculations we did a little earlier and sort of argued that this must be true. Uh, so in the case where you have a trajectory going around a circle and that velocity vector is only being changed by the radial acceleration, Oh, or the centripetal acceleration, uh, then you stay on this constant speed circle going around. But if you're speeding up, then there's a tangential component to the acceleration, and then the vector sum of these two vectors is not pointing towards the center of the circle anymore. It's increasing in speed. There's a component that keeps it on the circle, and then there's a component that sort of moves it uh, towards faster speeds. Similarly, uh, if it's decreasing, the velocity vector is pointing backwards with respect to the trajectory. There's a tangential component to the velocity that's slowing it down and a centripetal component that is driving it towards the center of the circle. Uh, so this is the case where the particle will be slowing down in terms of speed. Okay, so this is all good for circles, but not everything moves in a circle. And in fact, uh, we have kind of these arbitrary random trajectories that kind of do little loop-de-loops and go all over. And so we need to basically figure out what the accelerations are along these trajectories. And the key for doing that is to set up our very own coordinate system that's basically kind of locally like a circle. Uh, and we call this, uh, we'll call, I'll call this the NT or the normal tangent coordinate system, which is not the XY coordinate system, but it's anchored on the trajectory of the particle. And the N, uh, the T component is tangential, and it's a unit vector that points along the trajectory of the particle. And then the N component is normal to it, uh, and that normal is just the fancy math word of saying 90 degrees or perpendicular. Uh, so it is 90 degrees away from the tangential, so it forms an orthogonal or right angle coordinate system. And then it points towards the center of curvature for the curve. And the center of curvature for a curve is kind of tricky. That is basically if we represent the curve with a circle, Locally, we sort of imagine a circle that has the same curvature as the actual trajectory and uh, it, it and matches up and touches the uh, uh, trajectory right at this point. Then we get this little circle and the radius of that circle is called the radius of curvature. Now I'm going to swap, which is a statement without proof. Uh, I'm just going to assert this. This is the kind of thing where if you need this formula, we'll make sure that it, you know it shows up uh, for you. Uh, and we can say that if I know the x and the y of this uh, curve as a function of time, I can write down that uh, radius of curvature in terms of the time derivatives of the trajectory. Or what that practically means is it's the magnitude of the velocity vector cubed over V cross A, where the A is the acceleration uh, vector, and so and that's the magnitude of that. So we don't have to worry about uh, the directions or anything. Uh, this just gives us an expression for the radius. I'll note that a straight object has a um, radius of curvature that goes to infinity. It gets really large because it's not curving. Uh, okay, um, another way we might have another swap or statement without proof is if I tell you the y as a function of x, then you can figure out the radius of curvature for a path uh, by 1 plus the derivative squared over the curvature, d derivative dy by dx uh, squared, and these are all kind of, um, these are all non-negative uh, terms here. So we'll do some examples with this particular expression in class. Uh, these are here mostly for completion and the fact that when you see them in second year, you'll be like, I've seen that before, uh, but we'll uh, use this in some of our problems. But this is a way of representing an arbitrary trajectory locally as a circle. And in that case, I write down an acceleration vector here that is a uh, radial component of the acceleration in the n direction and a tangent component of the acceleration in the 
tangent direction. The tangent unit vector is always in the direction of the velocity. Remember, velocity is tangent to the curve. We use that by taking the velocity vector and dividing by the speed. That gives us a unit vector. And then the radial component, we already know. That's v squared over r, where r is the radius of curvature for a curve. We have one other thing to talk about, and that is the 2D case of relative motion. So, so far, we have only considered a fixed coordinate system appropriate for describing one object. But if there are multiple objects in a system, we really would like to describe how they move with respect to each other. So we can consider sort of two uh, observers considering an object moving here, in this case, P. And we'd like to understand how observer A and observer B describe the motion of P respectively. And I'm going to set up a weird notation. It's the same notation as in your book. And I'm going to say that in this case, the position of the object P right here as observed by A. So I'll use this P slash A notation to mean object P observed by A or with respect to A is the object P with respect measured with respect to B plus the separation between B and A. So that is object B with respect to A. And geometrically, this makes sense. This is object of P with respect to A is that one. And then that's object P with respect to B plus object A uh, uh, B with respect to A. Sorry, this should say B slash A because we're not savages here. Okay, so uh, that means that if I take the time derivative of uh, these uh, particles, we will often, uh, we, we just get a uh, fairly simple relationship that if I take the time derivative of, of those three vectors, we get that the velocity of P with respect to A is the velocity of P with respect to B plus the velocity of B with respect to A. And that follows by just passing the time derivative through. And here's the subtle point assuming everybody agrees on what the time is. We will break that assumption in about 10 weeks. Uh, but for now, this gives us an expression that simply says we can figure out what the velocities are uh, with respect to uh, two separate observers describing the same particle P. Okay. Now, uh, what happens for accelerations? Well, accelerations run into a uh, peculiar case, which is um, we can basically, oh, uh, one final note uh, that before I get into accelerations is that we, uh, since the vector B with respect to A is negative A with respect to B, we can do the exact same math and we get that these uh, two velocities, A with respect to B and B with respect to A, are negative. They're opposite, but with the same magnitude of each other, which I think is just something we will bank for later. Uh, we can return to velocities, take a second derivative again, and we get the acceleration of P with respect to A is the, the acceleration of P with respect to B plus the acceleration of B with respect to A. And what we typically want to operate in is the case where V with respect to A b with respect to a is a constant. And then the time derivative of that term is zero. And so these two accelerations are zero. This term here will drop out. In that case, we describe the a and b as operating in inertial reference frames. And that's important because inertial reference frames are the places where Newton's laws work. They don't work outside of inertial reference frames. That's where centrifugal and other fictitious forces are coming from. All of these relationships hold perfectly well in higher dimensions. The, all I've done here is I've added the velocity vectors. And if I consider A with respect to B, that's moving the opposite direction of B with respect to A. So these are all basically hold in one dimension and higher dimensions.
Hi everyone, uh, today we're going to be studying dynamics uh, and beginning to move into the second part of the course. Dynamics is the study of forces and in many ways this is the core idea of the course. So we'll be spending a few weeks uh, engaging with these concepts. So this is just the first part of the dynamics part of the course. Now dynamics uh, has multiple uh, components to it, uh, but we're going to start out by investigating just the nature of forces and the applications of Newton's law. In the first part of the course, we learned a lot about the mathematics of describing how objects move. That was the study of kinematics. Kine is uh, sort of the Greek root uh, describing motion. And so dynamics now is talking about why those objects move. In particular, as we'll discover, why objects accelerate. And so if you to develop this, we introduce the idea of a force. This is a physics definition. And we sort of loosely define forces as the interactions between objects that change their motion, which is a little circular, uh, but it's kind of a push or a pull. And uh, we can get actually a little bit more specific about forces and say that all real forces are forces between exactly two objects or between one object and a field. So forces operate pairwise, field and object, or between two objects. There aren't sort of three-part forces that require things that uh, to have three objects interacting uh, to create a force. Uh, there are always pairwise uh, interactions. Now, there are many types of forces. Uh, they are the, uh, we have contact forces, gravitational forces, tension forces, normal forces, spring forces, friction forces, and field forces. We just sort of list all of these forces, and these are the things that we will engage with in Physics 144 and one uh, later on in Physics 146. Uh, sorry, the weirdest one on here are the ideas of these field forces, uh, because it allows uh, forces to come up without objects actually being in contact with each other. And so usually you see that the force is related to the separation between uh, an object that creates a field and the object that is sort of feeling the field of that object. And we have have some experience with that, with gravity, electricity, and magnetism. And you've probably interacted with or experienced some of the physics of these forces before. Uh, and so, you know, here's a diagram of the electric field around a point, a positive point charge uh, near a conductor uh, down here. And uh, this is actually a very interesting kind of field force because almost all of the forces that we saw on the previous slide those are almost secretly entirely electric forces or electrostatic forces. So to explore that idea in a little more detail, uh, we want to think about matter. Matter is this kind of soup of positive and negative charges. And, you know, matter is made of atoms. Atoms have positive nuclei and electron clouds around them. And I kind of illustrate that here with uh, some positive charges shown in red and a sort of a soup of negative charges shown here in blue. And ordinary matter of two objects shown here and here um, has those two uh, charges co-located on an atomic level. Uh, but if we bring those objects close to each other, what happens is that the positive charges get forced close to each other and the negative charges come along. And the positive charges are sort of locked into a lattice-like structure. They're in, or if it's a, say, a crystal or just kind of in the, physics, uh, the physical object uh, that is, you know, the, the matter itself. Um, and so those are the atomic nuclei. The electrons are much more free to move. They're moving around the sort of the sort of network of positive atomic nuclei. And so when they get close to each other, the, uh, the negative charges in one object sort of respond to the negative charges in the other object and like charges repel. So they move to the opposite sides of the two objects coming together. The atomic nuclei don't have this liberty. 
uh, they are kind of locked into the structure of matter. And so what this does is there, it induces a small charge separation. And so the electric, uh, the negative uh, charges, the electrons move away, kind of exposing a little bit of positive charge. We call this process polarization. And then those positive charges repel. And so the actual force, if we're actually trying to touch two objects together, the force that we're feeling here is actually the repulsive force between these polarized electric surfaces. This is all happening at the atomic level. And so this uh, actual contact forces are really at their heart, these uh, kind of repulsive electric forces. So we'll be dealing with all of this. And it's kind of interesting because that illustrates that everything that we sort of discussed right here, the sort of forces of the atomic uh, interactions in matter are really electric forces and sort of boils down that like, you know, friction and normal forces and all those things, they're just electricity. And this kind of points to the basic idea that there are really only a few forces in the universe, despite us discussing normal forces and spring forces and friction and drag. All of those are electric. And other forces kind of fall into broader categories. And there are only four fundamental forces in the universe. Uh, they are gravity, electromagnetism, and then the strong and weak nuclear forces. And we are exploring and understanding the nature of the, um, the sort of first two forces here in introductory physics. We're really going to be focusing on gravity and electromagnetism, and we start out doing what we like to call classical theory, which is the theory that was developed starting with uh, Newton, um, back in the 17th century and moving on until about the early 20th century. These were very well developed through, uh, for gravity, say through Newtonian gravitation. At the end of the 19th century, there was this excellent theory of electromagnetism called Maxwell's theory of electrodynamics. And this introduced the idea and sort of rounded out the ideas of classical theory. Uh, these are things that involve calculus that involve fields, continuous motions of particles, all of these things work really well. The gravitation was amended and in fact generalized by Einstein in the early 20th century through the process of general relativity, but that's still a classical theory. Um, Classical theory is in contrast to quantum theory. And quickly after uh, general relativity, physics developed the ideas of quantum uh, to sort of explain the behavior of the atomic, uh, on the atomic scale of matter. And these theories uh, are kind of inconsistent with classical theory. It's a very different form of mathematics. But nonetheless, you can view electromagnetism through a quantum lens in a theory called quantum electrodynamics. This is actually an incredibly well-developed theory that describes how a lot of the universe works, and it works well at the regular scales and at the subatomic scales where quantum matter works. So it's a really beautiful theory here. And those quantum theories also were able to explain a lot of the behaviors of atomic parts of matter uh, through the strong and weak nuclear forces, which were purely quantum theories. There were no classical, uh, classical equivalents of these uh, theories. And theoretically, we can actually view electromagnetism and the weak nuclear force uh, in terms of something that's called electroweak theory, which is a superset of quantum electrodynamics, including the effects of the weak nuclear force. Uh, we can describe how the particles in atomic nuclei interact through a different branch of quantum physics called quantum chromodynamics. And so this kind of suggests that all of the four forces are developed ideas with quantum mechanics. Uh, and therefore, gravity should be quantum. Um, we do not have a quantum theory of gravity right now. It's been 
many decades of hard work and nobody has developed a complete uh, theory of gravitation that includes quantum uh, physics, but we believe that such a theory should exist. And so it's an active way that we want to develop ideas here in physics. But the high level point is to remember that all of the forces in the universe really boil down to these four and we'll be dealing primarily with the interactions of gravity and electromagnetism under classical theory at the beginning and then by learning how these theories work the quantum theories can uh, make much more sense because the compare and contrast gives you a lot of insight as to what's happening in the quantum world okay uh, putting this awesome future physics on hold, uh, we can return to the idea of forces. Uh, the next thing that we know about forces is that forces act as vectors. So this immediately justifies, well, why did we introduce the mathematics of vectors? And that's because forces are things that come with directions. That means that forces combine as vectors using vector addition. So I show sort of this force in red pushing down on a scale and then what the scale is going to read. If we push with one force, you get an answer of five newtons. Two forces uh, add vectorially to give you a larger force that's twice as big uh, and 10 newtons. And then if I sort of tilt the forces, the only thing that the scale responds to is the vertical components of those forces. And so we consider the vector addition of those in the vertical direction, and that'll give me an answer that depends on trigonometry of the 8.7 newtons. The horizontal components of those forces uh, cancel out. And then we describe how matter interacts with the forces using Newton's laws. So law, Newton's laws are physical laws. Uh, and it's interesting to sort of describe laws versus theory because it's not necessarily an idea that's well developed uh, earlier in your education. Uh, so I just want to note that Physical laws are the th things that w uh, describe the way the universe works when we observe it time and time again. In general, laws are fundamental relations that are developed empirically. That means by studying the universe around us and making predictions. Laws are not theories. Theories are well-developed mathematical systems that predict the behaviors of the universe possibly including physical laws. So I'm going to be describing Newton's laws of motion. They are not uh, necessarily a theory of motion. It doesn't explain why these things happen, but it does give you an answer for how the universe works. And so the first law is called, you know, Newton's first law describes what happens if there are no net forces on an object. If there are no net forces, then an object does not accelerate. So it either remains at rest or it is moving at a constant velocity. And that means vector velocity here. So not a constant speed, but a vector uh, velocity. It doesn't change direction either. That comes with some fine print that we kind of implied last in the previous videos. Uh, which is, this only works if you are in an inertial reference frame. And so if we're studying these objects with respect to the, uh, say, a stationary frame of reference on the Earth, there can be no acceleration between your reference frame and sort of the stationary frame of uh, the Earth or the universe. And so you don't apply Newton's law to an object when you or the object are attached to something that is accelerating. So if you are moving with a constant velocity, still in an inertial reference frame, but it's good to define inertial reference frames by identifying the things that aren't. So these are two examples of non-inertial reference frames. Uh, the first one is a linearly accelerating reference frame. Let's say you're embedded in this truck that's accelerating down the road, and you notice this mass from the ceiling sort of deflects backward with no obvious force on it. So it has not remained at rest with, uh, instead it is apparently deflected for no apparent reason apart from 
you know, you being embedded in this accelerating reference frame. So this means that Newton's laws can't apply because there's these forces that are kind of showing up or these, these accelerations that are showing up out of nowhere with no obvious force associated with them. Over here is a rotating reference frame, and it's kind of showed in two perspectives. Uh, from the top, this is an inertial reference frame. It's a top-down view of a rotating disk with a little ball on it and then a little reference marker right here. And so what's going to happen is that this ball is just going to be pushed out towards this little red market here. In the bottom is being locked in the rotating reference frame where this little dot, say an observer, is going to be kind of fixed in one place. And as I play this uh, animation, what you're going to see is two different perspectives on the motion. In the inertial reference frame, the ball just rolls on a straight line downward. But if you're inside this rotating reference frame, the ball starts rotating, moving towards you, but then kind of deflects out of the way as the platform spins. And so if you're this observer here at the red dot, you're seeing this football move with no obvious reason. It just deflects away. So you're not in an inertial reference frame. Uh, so this is called the Coriolis effect and it shows up in rotating references, uh, re reference frames for moving objects. Okay, so Newton's laws may seem obvious to you, but you gotta understand where they were uh, coming from, which is Newton replaced Aristotelian physics and a tenet that described motion under Arist Aristotle's physics is that all bodies move to their natural space, upward or downward, depending on their nature. And so this is just kind of weird. It's certainly not mathematical, and it doesn't make a lot of deep predictions, but it's the way that people described the universe. And really, it's just because there's friction and drag, and it seemed like all objects on Earth just would naturally come to rest over time uh, because that's what was observed. And it really wasn't until Newton was studying celestial mechanics where you don't have the effects of drag that it kind of occurred and was inspiring that maybe there was something on Earth that was unique and the universe as a whole operated differently. Okay, so um, let's return and recap Newton's first law. Uh, it's really a good framework for identifying inertial reference frames. If the first law is broken, you know you're not in an inertial reference frame, but formally, uh, Newton's first law is a corollary of the second law, which we'll get there. Uh, so when we say a body at rest tends to stay at rest, and the body at motion tends to stay in motion, that's just testing whether we're in an inertial reference frame. Okay, next step is the second law, but first we have to describe how forces relate to accelerations. And the key idea here is the idea of mass in an object. The more massive an object, the more uh, force is required to make it accelerate, or proportion, or equivalently, the less a given force will make it accelerate. So more massive objects accelerate less if you push on them with the same force. So there's this idea of mass in physics that is the resistance to acceleration. And it's not obvious that this is true, but empirically, the laws of the universe are that this is the equivalent to a measure of how much matter is in an object. Literally, the count of subatomic particles inside an object is how you figure out what its mass is. More on mass in a little bit, but um, we have this idea of mass, and it's basically the amount of stuff in an object. And that allows us to write down what Newton's second law is, which tells us that the sum of forces on an object is the mass times the acceleration. A few things to note. First, vector equation. Forces are vectors, accelerations are vectors, vector equation. Um, the thing on the left-hand side is telling us what is happening to an object, and the thing on the right side is telling us how that object is responding to it if it has a mass of m. The 
Uh, first time we encounter in Physics 144 the idea of a compound unit is here. It is the Newton. Uh, and so it is the SI unit of force. Um, and it's a compound unit, which is just determined by balancing units in this equation. Dimensional analysis tells us a Newton is a mass times an acceleration or a kilogram times a meter per second squared. So that is how we define a Newton. So we use that as a shorthand for uh, what's happening physically. Next, let's explore the vector nature of this equation. Uh, it holds in all directions. So it's a compact way of writing three equations. Some of the forces in the x direction is the mass times the acceleration in the x direction. Same thing for y and for z. And so it also tells us that if we look at vectors, things like this uh, indicate that we can have a case of statics, where if we have a pi, so indicated because there's a pi on it, uh, and we have forces balanced here as vectors, if the x and the y components of these forces balance in both directions uh, and sum together to be zero, the acceleration will be zero, and then the pi won't accelerate. Similarly, if we change the direction of the force, all of the magnitudes remain the same, uh, we can find out that the pi will accelerate. So we do the same thing, and we break down our vectors into their components, and carrying out the sum of the forces in both directions, the sum of the forces in the x direction is minus 8.7 newtons in the negative x direction, 7.1 newtons in the positive x direction, gives us a net force of minus 1.6 newtons in the x direction. In the y direction, it's going to be 7.1 up, 5 down, so it's a net force of 2.1 newtons in the plus y direction. And so that tells us the components of the force vector and the direction of the net force vector is what tells us where the pi will accelerate. So the kinematics are going to say that the pi is going to shoot off in this direction with a net force uh, set by these two components. The final thing with Newton's laws is that all forces come in pairs. This is Newton's third law. And I'm going to it's often stated colloquially as for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction, but there's a much better equation for it, which I'm going to write as this, which basically says that when one object A exerts a force on another object B, there is an equal and opposite force exerted by B on A. And so I'm using this notation here that uh, FAB refers to the force of object A on object B. And that means that it is going to have an equal and opposite, uh, so the negative uh, vector of force of B on A. And so it's useful to sort of keep track of uh, the force. Uh, the first part is what is pushing, and the second part is what is receiving that. Okay, few rules about Newton's third law. It's very, it is hands down the hardest of three Newtons, uh, of the three Newton law. So first off, these action-reaction pairs, these equal and opposite forces, always act on different objects. We'll talk about drawing free-body diagrams later, but they never appear on the same free-body diagram. Second thing is that action-reaction pairs are always the same kind of force. If it's a normal force or a contact force, the uh, action reaction is a contact force. If one's a friction force, the other's a friction force. If one is weight, the other is weight. Uh, or, you know, there are two gravitational forces. One is gravity, the other is gravity. So they're always the same type of force. And finally, they always have the same magnitude. Opposite directions, same magnitude. So this raises the question, if everything has an equal and opposite force, how does anything move at all? Well, the key to this is to come back to the idea that these action-reaction pairs act on different objects. So that's important because while the forces between two objects are the same, the accelerations are going to be different 
because the masses are different. If you are walking along the ground, there is a friction force that allows you to walk. That friction force is you pushing back on the earth. And then the equal and opposite friction force of the earth pushing on you is what's going to move you forward. You move forward given that force, but the earth is much more massive than you. So its acceleration is smaller by 22 orders of magnitude. And therefore you don't notice it, even though you do give the earth a tiny little acceleration back. So you move with respect to the earth because the masses are different, even though the forces are the same. Final thing to note is that we are in calculus land. And so we remember that when I write down F, the sum of forces is equal to MA, A is the time derivative of the velocity vector or the second time derivative of the position vector. And so that allows us to start to introduce the ideas of kinematics clearly into forces. It's kind of interesting. Why did we stop at the second derivative? Like we could take a third derivative of position. Uh, that's called the jerk. Uh, or you take the fourth derivative, which I believe is the snap. The fifth derivative is the crackle and the sixth derivative is the pop. Those Six the you can take as many derivatives as you want for a lot of our functions, but why do we stop at two? And that's because that is the law of the universe. Forces create accelerations. They don't change velocity or they don't create velocities. They do not create jerks. They create accelerations. And so that's why we stop at two time derivatives. It's just the law of the universe. Okay. These force methods with calculus are going to allow us to explore a lot of interesting additional techniques for our physics, which is later on we'll talk about the work energy. Well, that's just force and calculus acting over distance. There's impulse momentum, and that's force plus calculus acting over time. And then there's rotational motion, which is forces but on big objects. But all of this is the core of the physics that we need to do in this class comes here from these three Newton's laws. So we're there. We've introduced the core physics and now let's explore it. So I think the first thing I'd like to explore is the idea of how to introduce calculus and F equals MA. So let's think about if the particle is moving with a trajectory uh, given by this vector equation, and it has a mass m, what is the net force of the particle as a function of time? And just express your answer in terms of a, b, c, d, and m. Well, if we do that, um, all we have to do is recognize that this up here is the position of the particle. And so what we really like to do is figure out the acceleration. We first calculate the velocity vector as the time derivative of the position with respect to time. And that is something that we take component-wise. We take the time derivative of the first component. Uh, so that's going to be 3at squared minus b times t. Uh, oh, sorry, minus b, because we take the time derivative of the t, it, cancel, it goes away. It becomes t to the 0 in the i-hat direction, plus ct to the fourth, the derivative of that is 4ct cubed in the j-hat direction. And then for a trig function, we apply the chain rule. We take the derivative of the sine, which is a cosine. That's not something I'm expecting you to know directly yet. I'm just asserting it. And then we take the time derivative of whatever's inside. The time derivative of dt is just d. And so we're left with d cosine of dt k-hat. So far, so good. Let's take the acceleration. That's the time derivative of the velocity vector. And so then that is uh, time derivative of 3at squared is 6at. Uh, time derivative of b is 0. It's a constant. So 6at times i hat plus uh, 4ct cubed. Take the time derivative of that. We get 12ct squared. Uh, that's j hat. 
And then the time derivative of um, cosine is negative sine. And then I take the time derivative of what's inside. That gives another d. So this becomes negative d squared times sine dt k hat. Okay? And so then if I want to figure out the force, the force, the sum of the forces, is equal to the mass times the acceleration. And so I just multiply a mass through by every term. So it's 6 mat i hat plus 12 m c t squared j hat minus d squared m sine dt k hat. And we're done. Take two time derivatives and out comes uh, the, and multiply that mass, and that gives us the sum of the forces. All right, so that's just how we would deal with things in terms of calculus. We are going to move into vectors. And so the way we analyze systems always kind of follows the same core method, uh, which we're going to describe by first creating free body diagrams. We'll talk about those in a moment. Uh, the second is we choose coordinate systems. We write down F equals MA along the different directions of that of the selected coordinate systems. And then we solve these systems of equations for unknowns. Well, um, I want to emphasize step three here. Because in this class, the system that I will use is I'm going to rely on the coordinate systems and the free body diagrams to specify the directions of the forces with signs. And then the variables I'll be working with are going to typically be the magnitudes of the forces. So we will solve and identify magnitudes and we will use coordinate systems and drawings and the um, sort of free body diagram structure to actually tell us the vector direction and reconstruct that at the end. Okay, so let's start by talking about what free body diagrams are. Uh, here is a delightful image of a book resting on a table. Um, and so there's lots and lots of forces running around in this system. I've identified electric normal forces in blue and gravity in um, uh, black, and there's all these different components here. So there's a force of the table on the earth, the force of the earth on the table, there's a force of a table on a book, and a force of a book on a table, force of the earth on a book, that's gravity, force of the book on the earth, that's also gravity, earth on table, table on earth. So we have all of these forces, possibly too many forces to be useful, uh, and so if we want to study the book, we draw what's called a free body diagram, where we identify an object and find all of those forces that are acting on the book. So practically, if they're acting on the book, they have a book in the second letter. So it's force of blank on book. And there's two of them. There's FTB, that's that normal force. And we have FEB, that's the weight. And so we draw a little point representing our book, and then we draw the two force vectors attached to it. Force of table on book, force of earth on book. And then we can use the uh, sum of forces in the y direction, if it's just sitting there, set that equal to zero, and analyze this particular system. So let me stress again that we use the variables in terms of their magnitudes of the forces, and then we use signs and coordinate systems to keep uh, the directions straight. So we require establishing a coordinate system for this system to work. So we'll always try to be very explicit about what's happening with that. Okay, so we have this huge list of forces that we could possibly be dealing with here in Physics 144, and today I want to focus on the first three in this list, and we'll come back and deal with four, five, and six in the next part of the course. So let's start out with talking about gravity. Every massive object in the gravitational field of our planet feels the force that I will call weight. It is gravity pulling the object 
down towards the Earth. So this is how we define down. It's the way our gravitational field is oriented. Weight uh, always has a magnitude of mass of the object times the local gravitational acceleration, and it always points downward. If we define plus y to be going up, then the force of gravity is always going to have the form of minus mg in the y direction. Or in the absence of other forces, then we would say that negative mg is the mass times the acceleration of, the y, of y, and so everything will accelerate downward at g. That's how we define our gravitational acceleration. Now, more generally, uh, you may have seen a form of Newton's law of, or gravitation, which says this is g times the mass of the Earth. This is why astronomers like me like to draw the Earth, a little O with a plus in it. Uh, mass of Earth times the mass of the object divided by r squared. So if we have the mass of the Earth, r is the distance from the center of the Earth to the object, and then um, uh, m is the mass of the little object and it acts in a opposite direction of this radial offset. Uh, so there's a little negative sign. It's an attractive force pulling it. If we then define that radius vector r to be the distance to the edge of the Earth, the surface of the Earth, plus a little bit more that I'll call y. So if little r is the radius of the Earth plus y, and then y is much, much less than the radius of the Earth, then I can rewrite my magnitude of this force as gmm over r plus y quantity squared, or if I pull out g mass of Earth over the radius of the Earth squared, pull that out into one term, I get a second term that is one over one plus y over r of Earth quantity squared, and then I get the mass of the object that's being pulled downward. Now, if the height is small compared to the radius of the Earth, which is 6,378 kilometers, if, it is, if you're falling a centimeter, it is small, so that 1 plus a centimeter over 6,000 kilometers, quantity squared, is going to be a number that is very, very tiny. It will differ from 1 by about a part in 10 to the 18. Then you say this is approximately equal to and so this thing will just multiply away to nothing. And then you get a jumble of constants, g, mass of the planet over the radius of the planet squared, times m. And we can combine these to get the gravitational acceleration. If you go and you look up the mass of the Earth and the radius of the Earth and all that, you find that g is 9.798 meters per second squared. But we have adopted a standard gravity unit, which is 9.80665 meters per second squared, because the Earth is a little non-spherical and it's also spinning and they've picked a characteristic latitude where this gravitational constant is true. Uh, and so we simply adopt this as a standard of gravity, but it does vary by a couple percent over the surface of the Earth. So your local gravity will be different from the standard gravity, but we really only want to remember one for most of our uh, purposes. Okay, that's weight and gravity. The next thing I want to talk about is normal forces. Um, so what is a normal force really? Um, I want you to sort of consider this edge on perspective of a crappy uh, table. Uh, and I'm going to put an object on it. And so what's happening when I put it on this flimsy little table is the object, the table will deform a little bit. And so the internal structure of the table is going to resist this object on it, and it's going to push back on it. If I push more object, uh, uh, put more force on it, it's going to deflect more, and it's going to push back on it. Uh, and so the force is going to act what we call normal to the surface, which means it is perpendicular to the surface. So that's why we call them normal forces. Uh, that normal force can be larger than a surface can maintain, and it will break. But otherwise, that normal force provides exactly enough force to balance the forces that bring them into being. So it will basically deform to a point 
where the object comes to equilibrium. So the normal force will balance however hard the object is pushing down on it. So the normal force will therefore change in magnitude so that the surface does not accelerate. And so the object remains on the surface. Okay. The next type of forces I want to talk about are tension forces. And initially in this class, we will deal mostly with massless ropes uh, or massless cables or objects. They will often be called light cables, which just means ignore the mass. Um, so what a string or a rope or a cable it does is it exerts tension. And what that does is if I pull on one end of a rope, the other end will pull with the same magnitude on an object, and the force is going to be the tension force that's within a rope. Now, since the force is massless, uh, that allows us to essentially transmit forces through systems, which is a weird way of putting it. But it, um, the massless means that the tension does not vary through the rope. So consider this, there's a rope here, there's a little blue section that we're gonna analyze. It's massless, but I'm going to imagine that it's being pulled on with two tension forces, T1 and T2, in this coordinate system in the X and the Y direction. And T2 and T1 are pulling in opposite directions uh, from each other. So the difference between those is going to specify the mass times the acceleration. Since it's massless, m is zero, and so those two tensions must be equal uh, to each other. And so that's why the tensions are the same all along a massless rope. It also tells you that the tensions must vary on a massive rope. Okay, so uh, the tension on a rope basically is going to always pull towards the center of uh, the rope. Uh, so in this case, I have a cow suspended from a ceiling, and from that cow, I've attached a bag of wasabi peas, and there's a massless rope between them. The tension in that cable is going to pull up on the wasabi peas and down on the cow. And so these two blue arrows are going to kind of pull together. They are largely keeping the uh, uh, rope pulling in the same direction. Uh, so... If, uh, and since the rope is massless, the tension magnitudes will be the same, even if uh, the directions are different. Similarly, we'll often deal with pulleys in this part of the class. If they are massless, again, something will relax later. Uh, all they do is they change the directions of forces, but not their magnitudes. And so this redirects the direction of a tension force. Um, we also will encounter the idea of constrained accelerations. We'll explore this in a little more detail later. Uh, but we often use ropes and pulley systems to connect objects together physically, and so their accelerations will have the same magnitude, but not necessarily the same direction here. So here, object one and two will have different directions they are accelerating in, even though the magnitude of those accelerations are going to be related to each other. In this case, they'll be equal, but in some systems, they are simply mathematically related. Okay, so to summarize, gravity is a neat force. It has a very clear formula here near the surface of the Earth. The force is mass times the local gravitational acceleration, g. Uh, tension and normal forces do not have formulas. They are instead set by the problem. They are called constraint forces, which means they are set by what needs to happen to make what we are observing in a problem true. And so we'll often just have a set where we'll be able to analyze and determine what the tensions and normal forces are based on the physics within the problem.